I'm Dave Franzen. I'm one of the extension soil specialists at NDSU, but I was charged to uh, talk about uh, deep banding and uh, where that fits and and uh, what that's all about. So, so there's really two big reasons why a person sh might consider deep banding, and they, they may not even be what you're thinking about. Uh, but the two big reasons are, first of all, if you're if you're wanting to save soil and build structure and and uh, use your nutrients more efficiently and all those good things uh, and you decide to go into a modified no-till uh, system for your corn soybeans then you're probably looking at a strip till unit like you know what you're going to see all over this place today so so that's the thing and and they're all set up in one way or the other to deliver deliver fertilizer uh, deeply into the soil. So if you're already set up with one of these things, it's just kind of a no-brainer that, you know, just go ahead and put your P and K, and if it's the right time of year, maybe the nitrogen down, uh, and save a trip across the field, because we're, we're all about that, right? We all want to save time, money, all those kind of things. So so that's the number one reason. The number two reason is more uh, of, um, of a, uh, what, environmental plus economic reason. That is the alternative, of course, is to broadcast it over the surface, uh, probably. And in Minnesota, which most of you are from Minnesota, you have this entity called the Minnesota Pollution Control Board, right? And and so the last thing you want to do is have somebody knock on your door and say, say, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. So the the, the less you have that kind of situation going on, the the better I think everybody would be. So. So that's the thing. If you if you put the phosphate on the surface and you have, uh, let's say, you do it in the late fall, and then you have snow or rain or whatever or a mix of everything, and I've seen it all in this area, uh, that time of year in November, uh, then you're going to have some of the phosphorus phosphorus move off your field either by itself or with the soil, and and uh, that's not good environmentally because of your lakes and eutrophication and all that. But also, uh, you know, you're paying what $500 a ton for map. I mean, I, I think if I were you, you'd want to make sure that if you paid for a pound of P205 that it actually was going to be on the field the next year. And one way to ensure that for sure is to put it underneath and then whatever happens in the fall of the year, uh, your phosphorus loss is minimized. So those are the big two. So you're thinking, well, what about efficiency? So back in the 80s when uh, the idea, uh, the most recent idea of deep banding uh, phosphorus potassium was born, uh, there were a few studies out of Kansas, and I think Bill Denke, uh, who worked at NDSU back in the back in the 80s, 90s, uh, played around with it a little bit. And and the and the first few trials that were done, it looked like there was a, a nice efficiency factor. But but a, a a good friend of mine, an old colleague that's retired now, he, he said that if you really wanted to be excited about research, you'd end it after one year. And if you really wanted to do know the truth, then you do it more than one year. And so the truth is, is that over over the span of all the studies that have been done across the Midwest, all over, is that there's really no efficiency advantage of deep banding compared to broadcast. And you say, well, if you're if you're banding and you're a system like this, or I mean, if you're broadcasting and you're a system like this, what happens is that you get what you call stratification where the soil test P and soil test K, they're all elevated in the top inch or so. So, so isn't it better to have the, the nutrients mixed in the lower layers? And, and this freaked a lot of soil scientists out in the 70s when the movement, mostly grower-based, was going on about zero till. They, they said, well, we can't do this because we're going to stratify these nutrients and the crops are going to go deficient and it's going to be a disaster. And so they set up these long-term experiments and, you know, after about 10 years, they're like, the crops really don't care where it is as long as it's there. And, and to some of you, that may not make any sense. You know, you got all the nutrients in the top inch or two, and then, you know, you're depleted down below. So what happens in a dry year? Okay, so let's talk about what happens in a dry year. In a dry year, of course, that, you know, after about two, two weeks or something like that, that top couple inches or so is going to be dirt dry. And, and... And so, yeah, at that period of time, if you had something deeper, it would be more, more available to plant. But that, but that deeper moisture only sticks around for a short period of time, another week or so. And that 8, 10 inch, 12 inch area is dry too because the crop has been pulling moisture out of the ground. And so it's just as dry as what it is on top. So what kind of weather conditions do we have during a dry year? During a dry year, we get, you know, a little piddly tenth, we get a, you know, a quarter inch, you know, maybe if you're lucky, get a half inch. Is that enough to wet the, 
a foot down in the soil? No, it's not, but it wets up the top, right? And so I think that's why we see that in these long-term experiments, there's really no difference between putting the, putting the phosphorus and the potash deep or putting it on top is because even in the dry years, there's enough moisture at the surface for those little root hairs and the hyphae of the corn plants to pick that up and, and they're okay. So, so efficiency, no, I mean, that's not really a reason. But if you don't believe the science, I don't really care if you do or not, there's other reasons why putting it down, like I said before, the environmental reasons and the economic reasons and the, and, uh, and the idea that maybe you have already a unit that's gonna go across the field like this, a strip tiller, and, and so just go ahead and, and do it. So there's, there's nothing wrong with deep tilling, uh, but if I was gonna pay for a special trip across the field in order to get that P and K lower, I, I wouldn't do it. But if I was gonna go across the field anyway, then go ahead and do it, and that's fine. So, so the next thing is about how deep is deep. So you know, when we're not talking about the little bit of P and K that we might put with the seed or near the seed, you know, which we all do because we're all north of the Kelvin. And if you don't know what that means, ask your neighbor because you probably heard my story before. But what we're talking about is, is, that, is that deep placement. So what about deep? What if you're using one of these things, how deep should you really, really go? Well, the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to go into the spring of the year and plant the seed into that concentrated band of fertilizer that you put in the, on, the, on the previous fall. Because there's still salt, there's still urea, there's still ammonia, there's still stuff. So you don't want that. So you want enough distance, and with just P and K, a couple inches difference is enough. Okay, so you're going to plant the seed. Does that mean that you put the, in the fall of the year, you, you just put it two inches below that? And the answer is no, because over the wintertime, things settle, right? And so two inch difference in the fall might mean only, a, say, an inch difference as you go into spring. And Okay, so the question was, okay, so we've had a lot of, uh, a lot of dust move in North Dakota and, and a lot of the phosphate, I, I got a lot of people's attention because, and it's a true, that a lot of our native fertility went off with the, with the dust. And so the question is, where does the dust go? Um, if, uh, as an, ex, an as a aspiring uh, oceanographer in high school, I read a lot of stuff uh, and, uh, and about core sampling in the Atlantic Ocean and that they could, you know, they could figure out how many years that core was old by the number of layers. Okay, guess where some of those layers come from? They come from North Dakota. So they go on the Atlantic. That dust travels thousands of miles all over the place. And so it, uh, only a small amount ever gets in the ditch. Only a small amount ever gets to the neighbors. A uh, large amount goes the long way away. Back in the 30s, uh, one, of the, one of the ways we know how valuable that dust was is that you could go out in the Central Park in New York and pick up North Dakota soil by the spoonful and bring it into the lab and analyze it. I mean, it, hundreds, thousands of miles. Uh, dust, dust storms of any size are not just what you see running across the road, but they have a three-dimensional height to them. Um, the very serious dust storms back in the 30s, there were pilots going into Bismarck that that told the people that there was significant dust up to 14,000 feet. We can, with the satellites now, we can see dust storms from space. So you can go online and look at dust storms in the Palouse, dust storms in western China and northeast China, in any place in the United States where you hear that there's some dust storms around and you can see the three-dimensional aspect of all those storms. And even our little dust storms have a three-dimensionality to them. And the most nutritive part of the dust is the part that's way up in the air. The crap is down along the, 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 the soil surface, and that's the stuff that gets in the ditch, the large particles. But the real fine stuff with all the nutrients, that's way up there. Yeah, so the, so the question is, what's the amount, maximum amount of P and K that you'd put down deep placement? So, so that, that answer is at the core of any consultant question. <laughs> so the answer depends on uh, price of corn, price of phosphate the farmer's financial condition, what that financial's ownership or non-ownership of the land is, what their personal philosophy in farming is. Are they going to, are they going to, are they going to will the, the farmland out to a, to a son or daughter? Is it going to stay in the family or are they going to sell it to some hunter in Chicago or something? So all of those things come into play. And so what's the answer? The answer is, the answer is, is as much as all of those 
all those factors will allow you to put on. For seedling protection? You know, I don't know, there's probably no practical reason to put more than three or four hundred pounds of map or three or four hundred pounds of potash on. As long as you have the separation, the crop will stand it fine. Because the, the damage to the the damage to the plant is not so much with the roots because if it's too hot, they'll just grow around it. The damage to the plants is at the seed at the seed level. You know, the salt with the seed because it's a living thing. If it's, if it's too much salt, it won't imbibe water, it won't grow. And if there's ammonia in it, it'll just kill the seed just like that. Part, part per million or two of ammonia and that seed's history.